I think you have seen it somewhere before, so um, I'm back, inshallah. Before we um, start, while we get the people in, maybe I'll read a short qasida for you. Uh, ya Habibi, maybe you'll uh, like to listen to that while you settle down. So maybe I'll leave one stand there, then you can uh, start to the word. <clears throat> Oh, my Habibi, salamun alayk Ya miski wa tibi, salamun alayk Ya awn al-gharibi, salamun alayk يا عون الغريب سلام عليه أحمد يا محمد سلام عليك طه يا ممجد سلام عليك أحمد يا محمد طه يا ممجد من زارك يا سعد سلام عليه طه يا حبيبي سلام عليه يا مسكي وطيبي سلام عليك يا عون الغريب سلام عليك يا عون الغريب سلام عليك صلوا على النبي الله بير الله صل على سيدنا محمد Assalamu alaikum people. Inshallah, we're starting with a uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation. Inshallah, we'll try to make Asr in 25 minutes' time. We'll pray Asr on time, Inshallah. We'll take a break for Asr. We'll pray the Asr and immediately come back. If you don't come back immediately, where's the boy? There's no dinner for you. Okay, so, so the sooner you come back, you get served dinner first. No, Inshallah, so when you come back, I'll conclude the sec uh, segment. And this is more about activating ourselves and I'll be giving notes to you. One of the things that I just picked up, someone brought to my attention and thank you for that, that the first quotation that we have there, it was in your note it says saying of the Prophet. It was an error that's uh, in, the, in, the, in the copy. It's not a saying of the Prophet, it's a qual al it's saying of the wise. So when you get the note, by the way I have notes, whatever you see in the PowerPoint is, uh, will be given to you. It won't be in color people, it will be black and white but nonetheless. So you have a black and white copy, whatever you see here, will be on there. Uh, but, just remember, yours, yours will say, saying of the Prophet, it's not supposed to be that, it's supposed to be a qual al or the saying of the wise. And that's why you see here we rectified that. Thank you very much for bringing it to my attention. So, the, very briefly, this is uh, something you can take hours or whole day, but nonetheless, how do we activate ourselves as individuals towards an ideal community? And remember, ideal is something that you pursue. There's something which you have, something which you uh, aspire to. You may even attain it, but you're aspiring towards it. The idea of, of doing excellently, never reaching perfection, but inshallah, always improving, always doing the best you can. And inshallah, the idea of tahseen of ihsan, of trying to be good and improve it, inshallah. So I begin with the saying, I'amal li dunyaak anna ka ta'ish abada wa amal li akhiratik anna ka tamudu. Ghada is saying of the wise, which is, Work for this world as if you are going to live forever and prepare for the hereafter as if you are going to die tomorrow. And this is also a saying of, a, reflected in the saying of uh, Abdullah bin Mas'ud, who was a companion of the Prophet, uh, who said that, you know, uh, uh, if you go and sleep at night, إِذَا أَمْسَيْتَ فَلَا تَنْتَظِرِ السَّبَاحِ وَإِذَا أَصْبَحْتَ فَلَا تَنْتَظِرِ الْمَسَاءِ وَخُذْ مِنْ سِحَتِكَ الْمَرِكِ وَمِنْ حَيَاتِكَ Means, sorry for the camera person, I'll be moving around a little bit, so uh, you have to move around. So, which basically meant that when you go sleep at night, there's no bed. <laughs> Hello, yeah. 
Jeszcze raz. Okay. So the, the saying of the companion of the Prophet uh, Abdullah bin Mas'ud was that he said that if you sleep at night, there's no guarantee you'll wake up in the morning. And when you wake up in the morning, there's no guarantee that you will sleep the night. So take from your health what will benefit you in your illness. And take from your life what will benefit you beyond this world, beyond, beyond that. So here we find that the, the, this notion of doing the best you can. Remember in Islam, we have this notion of Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi l'akhirati hasana wa qina adabata. Allah, we want the best in this world and the best in the hereafter, but in the process, ensure that you don't end up worthy of being in the fight. So, wealth, knowledge, position, power, doesn't matter. If any of them corrupt you, then that's a problem. Now Shiraz gave me his mic. So now Alhamdulillah. Alright. So the life of the believer when we start off revolves around few fundamental aspects. One is first of all the notion of Iman. Iman, the idea of faith. This is primary. And I will explain that when I speak about our relationship and our attitudes. And I'll be very brief by the way because there's a lot of information we're going to go through in the next short while. And uh, I've done something similar like this over a day and a half. So I'm going to do it with you in 45 minutes inshallah. And luckily I speak fast so I can save time. Anyway, so it revolves around Iman and Amal al-Salihah, the idea of faith, and that faith reflected in good beneficial action. That's why you find the Quran, this idea of Iman and Amal is very much linked up. The notion of Iman and Amal is so much linked that the Prophet ﷺ said, Al-Iman wa al-Amal qarinan la yuslihu kullu wahid minhuma illa ma'a sahibu. That faith and action are partners to one another, they intertwine, that one is incomplete without the other. So faith and action. So by virtue of the fact that a person is a believer, the very fact that you are a conscientious being, aware that you are a creation of Allah, accountable to Allah, that you'll be held responsible for what you do, that will motivate a person to do what is right, to do what is best, and to avoid what is wrong. And hence, a person who is a, who is a person of faith, should be a catalyst for good. You know what's a catalyst? You know when you have an experiment in science, they sometimes add something to it, they want to speed up something. So it, it motivates the thing to go quicker. A catalyst inspires, motivates, moves something fast towards a, a destination. So you should be a catalyst for good wherever you find yourself. Whether you're Muslim majority, Muslim minority, doesn't matter. And the believer therefore has no option but to be one who's an activist in that regard, an activist. In other words, you are never on the fence. You're never on the fence. Okay? You always participate at some level. Some may participate more than you in different levels, but you're never someone who sits on the fence. You always engage. For example, the Rasul said, the Hadith, he said, مَرَّ أَمِنْكُمْ مُنْكَرًا فَالْيُغَيِّرُ بِيَدِهِ فَإِنْ لَمْ يَسْتَطِعْ فَبِنِسَانِهِ فَإِنْ لَمْ يَسْتَطِعْ فَبِقَلْبِهِ وَذَلِكَ ضَعْفُ الْإِمَانِ For example, whosoever observes something wrong must do something physically about it. If you cannot do some act against it, at least speak out against it. If you cannot speak out against it, at least dislike it in your heart. You can't be indifferent. Oh, I see oppression here. Oh, I think I said my business, I didn't do anything. No, you should at least, the least of your iman is to feel bad. How could this happen? So the idea is that you have no option but to be an activist. You are never indifferent. A believer is never indifferent to the reality. The question, now by the way, you may find in the notes, I, give, I may give quotes from Muslims, from non-Muslims, and I don't hesitate to quote from people. Because we have a tradition, Take wisdom from any source. It's wise, not contrary to the principles of Islam. It's something which is good, we can learn from it, benefit from it. I quote it. This is an ancient Tibetan saying. If you want to know your future, then look at what you are doing at this moment. Because what you are going to be tomorrow, you are becoming today. If you are, for example, a tennis player, you will someday come tomorrow morning or next week and be a master. No, you've got to learn one by You learn Arabic, for example. You won't one day wake up, inshallah, 10 years from now and start speaking, speaking fusha fluently. No, you've got to learn one word at a time. If you want to say, I want water, you learn for the word I want, you learn the word water. One by one. So my point I'm making is, you achieve, you acquire, it's a process. So what you are going to be tomorrow, you are becoming today. If you are not on the path, if you're not on the ladder climbing towards the destination, if you're not on the freeway going in the direction, you will not get there. So be very aware of that. So ask yourself 
This is the question. Ask yourself, each one of us, where are you in life and where are you heading to? And by the way, this can be used at the individual level, it's a personal thing. It can be used as a relationship between husband and wife, between children in the school and so on, or in our involvement in the community. And I'm talking, focusing more on that, but nonetheless, it can be taken at any, any level. Where am I in life? Where am I? And where am I going to? The way I am right now, what am I heading towards? Which direction am I going? If I continue doing what I'm doing right now, where will I end up? You see, you can't continue on the freeway all the time driving and say, ah, this is where it takes me. No. Because when you get there, you'll be disappointed. It may be the wrong venue. So you've got to know where you're going. So in order to know where you're going to end up, you must know what you're doing now. If you want to know what you're going to be, see what you're involved with. If you're in bad company for the youth, if you're in bad company, bad friends, bad results. You can't expect, I have bad company, but I'm a good guy. It doesn't work like that. So see where you are in life and where are you going to, number one. The choice, there are two primary choices. Either accept things the way they are or accept the responsibility for changing them. Now, very often, you can't change what happens to you. Sometimes things happen. You lose your job, maybe not your fault. Earthquake happens, you lose your house. You can't always control what happens to you, but you can control always how you react to the reality. It's very important. So you're never really helpless. Sometimes you're a victim, but you're never helpless. And Allah will hold you accountable to the extent of what you can do. So you don't always choose what happens, but you can choose how you react to what happens. Somebody is rude to me. I can be rude back, or I can say, no, I shouldn't do this. That's a better way of answering, or better way of responding. Now, normally our person would say, oh, he was rude to me, I'll be rude to him. If he lies to me, I'll lie to him. No. This is the attitude of a Muslim. The attitude of a Muslim is, what is the best thing for me to do? If somebody is rude or vulgar or whatever, how do I respond? I'm in bad company, what do I do? How do I respond to the reality or to the challenges? So we have two primary choices. Things are the way they are, uh, let it be the way it is. That's one way. And things continue being that way, and you are partly responsible. If you are indifferent towards that, you allow it to happen. If I see someone oppressing somebody else, and I can do something about it, I don't get involved, then what happens is I'm allowing it to happen. Because I could intervene. The Quran says, "Ma yashfa shafaat al hasana yakul lahu nasibu mina, wa ma yashfa shafaat al siya yakul lahu kiflu mina." Wa kana Allahu ala kulli shayin. Whoever assists and aids directly or indirectly in, in any good thing shares in the benefit thereof, and whoever aids and abets something which is evil or wrongful, you share the consequence thereof, and Allah keeps account of everything. So, what is the question? Where are we, and where are we going to? Number two, we have a choice: accept things the way they are or accept our responsibility for changing them. Then, realize one thing. Life is very short. We are in this world, the Quran says, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةِ لِيَبَلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا We've given you death and life in order to test you by means of your deeds. Life is a test, all of it. Sometimes Allah tests you with difficulty, and sometimes He tests you with, with ease. And a believer, therefore, always a sake of shukr, and always a sabr. If something goes hard, Alhamdulillah, do the best you can, have faith, do the best you can. And if you are in good state, don't forget, fitna comes in two ways. Some people think that trials and tribulations or bala comes only with hardship. No. Sometimes Allah can test you with good things. Like, you know, you have a hard life, you know, when you are down and out, you have no job. Oh Allah, please give me a job. You have an exam tomorrow. Even if you don't believe, oh Allah, there's a Lord in heaven, please help me. Because you are desperate. You are desperate. But you know what's the worst is? It's when everything is going good. You're making good money. You are saying, I don't need anybody. I don't need God. That's a bigger test. Sometimes when you have, when you don't have, it's more difficult upon you physically. But it's easy to handle because you are humble. You are forced, oh God, please help me, please help me. Whereas when you are in a position of ease, who cares? I'm in power, I'm in authority, I have the money, I don't care. I don't need anybody. That can, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to know, know the poor people. I don't know my old family. They were too backward. They are too poor. They are too low class. So Allah says, that test can be worse. Okay? So very careful. Allah tests you sometimes with wealth, with knowledge, with power. So it's only this, when we realize our, our, our time in this world is very limited. If you understand that, then we realize we need to live our day to the fullest. 
make every day count. As the Rasul said in the dua I gave you earlier on, O oh Allah, let every moment of every day be an opportunity for increased goodness. And don't let two days be the same, don't waste your time. Okay? So the idea is, realize the fact that time is short. We have a limited time, we don't know how long we are here. We know how from our birth till now we can calculate. From now to our death we don't know. We are born into the loop of death. Inna lillah wa inna rajiun. We don't know how far we are into the circle. It may be such a circle, it may be so a circle. Where are we? We don't know. And you'll be accountable for your deeds. What are you doing with that life? Next point is the need to develop the self. To be able to engage the world, the future, the reality of the challenge we face. Check what you are doing today for tomorrow. Ittaqullah wal tawndur nafsum ma qaddamat liqad. That each individual self be conscious of Allah and realize what it's sending forth for tomorrow. So, prepare yourself to engage that reality. Prepare yourself to engage that reality. Many of us think the only way we prepare ourselves is to do a right, a proper degree to get a proper job. And once I've done that, I've taken up on the challenge of life. That's one of the dimensions. There are many other things. And very often, unfortunately, our plans when it comes to changing society or improving society or community, we're thinking of how we can change other people. You see, we had a marriage seminar recently in Southern California. And the idea was, oh, how can I find the right husband? How do I find the right wife? No, be the right mate yourself. First thing for you to find the right husband or right wife is to be the right person yourself. I ask people, the guys, so uh, what do you want? Uh, I said, no, I want uh, uh, ladies should be like Aisha and Khadija. I said, please, be honest about it. Well, what do you want? And if I find Aisha and Khadija and so on, where's the Ali and Abu Bakr and, and Umar? Where are they? If I do find Fatima, where's the Ali? So be very cautious. You want all that? Are you all that? That's important. So the point is, too often our plans revolve around changing people and not focusing on what we need to do ourselves. And therefore it said, one of the um, uh, empowerment uh, uh, um, scholars said, we cannot become what we need to be by remaining what we are. You can't become what you need to be by remaining what you are. Because if you remain what you are, you remain where you are. Okay. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Inna Allah la yughayyiru ma biqawmin hatta yughayyiru ma bi anfusim. And this verse has many dimensions to it. One of the dimensions of that is, surely Allah will not change the condition of a people unless they change what is within themselves. Unless they change themselves or what is within themselves. Change begins with the self. When the Rasul alayhi salatu salam came, he began with four people. Khadija, Ali, Abu Bakr and Zayn. Male. Female, old, young, local, foreign, rich, poor. In the four people, the cross section of society. Khadija was a female. Ali was a boy and a family member. Abu Bakr was a friend and the elder. Zayd was a foreigner and a former slave. So you have in the four people a cross section of society. He began with individuals. After 13 years of, of, of preaching in Mecca, about 130 to 140 followers. 13 years of preaching. Less people he had after 13 years than half the whole. But it's the quality of people, not the quantity of people. It's the quality of the people that he had, not the quantity that he had. So Allah doesn't change the condition of a people unless they change what is within themselves. Then, a point. Time is free. We have time, as I mentioned in the previous one. But, but time is priceless. I mentioned in the previous lecture, the, uh, the Quran makes uh, this reference to time, the two chapters titled time. Time is free, but it's priceless. You can't own it, but you can use it. You can't keep it, but you can spend it. And once it's gone, it never comes back. It's very unique about time. You can spend it, but you don't own it. Okay? You can use it, but you can't keep it. Be aware of that. So make valuable use of your time. Right. One of the reasons why we don't do what we need to do is somebody will do it. Something will get done. We find excuses not to do. Many of us, inshallah, that's why we have New Year's resolutions, right? Whenever you make it, you make it Muharram or in, in New Year or whatever you make it. And inshallah after January the 1st or Muharram the 1st, we say, from next year onwards. I'm going to start dieting from next week. It never happens. The next week never comes or whatever it may be. So we procrastinate. Procrastinate means you put off. Procrastinate, avoiding the task that needs to be done. 
And some of us procrastinate, you know how we do it? Not by not doing what needs to be done, but our priorities are messed, messed up. We mix up our priorities. We do secondary things, we forget the main things. We'll learn to make, we remember to make dhikr, we'll forget to make salah. For example, so the dhikr is good, but salah is more important, it's harder. So begin with what you need to do. Okay? We can help the mosque, or we help the poor, we help, and you don't help your own family. Begin, you can where it's supposed to begin. So the idea is, so you may do something to cover up what you're supposed to do, but you need the main task. Sometimes it happens. So you avoid the task that needs to be accomplished, and you delay things that need to be done. That's why many people's lives are very cutting. They're piling up things of last year and year, and it goes on and on, and eventually you don't do any of that. There are two main causes why people do this, generally. One is to do with the thinking, and one is to do with the behavior, and thereafter we'll make salah, inshallah. We'll come back to the second tier. And I promise to keep it short after that, if you promise to stay awake. Crooked thinking, based on negative perception, which doesn't help, negative, it's uh, not productive, and it prevents people from doing what needs to be done. This is like excuses. Oh, what difference will it make if I do this? Oh, I don't want to do it with them. You know, whatever it may be. People become divided instead of coming together and working together and getting things done. Ah. Number two, learned behavior. Acting the way you are accustomed to. This is how we always do it. If the way you always do it was wrong, change it around. You can't keep on doing it. You can't keep on doing it. I had somebody who had a funeral recently. And alhamdulillah, may Allah grant the person Jannah and the family was patient. And then the person was really in debt because they were trying to cook food for the people to come to the house because there's some program there. I said, why are you doing it? Trying to afford it. But that's why everybody does. I said, you broke. Why are you feed the people? What do the people say? Let them say what they want to say. You're in a position to do this kind of thing. Be very cautious about these kind of things. So sometimes you do things that we can't even afford to do or manage to do, but we are accustomed to it. So we'd rather struggle, we'd rather strive, we'd rather go in debt, but we're going to continue doing it. So two, there are many reasons, but two main reasons. Our thinking isn't right, or our practice is wrong. So in other words, we do the secondary thing, but not the proper thing. Inshallah. Let's pray and we come back. We will, we will take it further from there, inshallah. I was speaking about the points of uh, overcoming procrastination and the idea of procrastination is when people delay what they need to do. And some people delay it so much they never get to down, down to doing it. So the idea I said was there's two main reasons why people do that. One is the way they think and the other one is their behavior. They continue to do the same thing they were used to doing so they don't change. And that's why they, uh, they delay to do what needs to be done. Now. There are three excuses people, or three ways that people uh, avoid doing what needs to be done. Three basic ways. One is what we call action cop-outs. Basically, people block out focusing on the priority. This happens very, very often, even in organizations, even institutions. What is the priority? What's the main thing? Even in family, even in relations, even in society, even organizations. What is the main purpose? We get dragged into secondary issues, side issues, side matters. They're fundamental to our lives. People worry about madahib, about issues, and they argue and debate about Shi'i and Sunni and Sufi and Salafi. And that's not the issue right now. We have major problems, the country's virtually collapsing under economic uh, uh, mismanagement. Many issues, people are losing their jobs, insecurity, uh, youth are not... Uh, uh, confident about the future, fundamental aspects, domestic abuse, is that issue that we are having. How do we deal with these realities? We don't have the luxury to argue about whether we are, uh, what madhab we belong to. This is a, a fundamental thing for us right now. And if you're focusing on that, you're focusing on the wrong thing. So one of the things is we block out focusing on the priorities by engaging in secondary issues. What is this? What is that? Uh, it doesn't matter. Number two, mental excuses. You think, no, I won't do it now, I'll do it later. It's better to do it later, I don't think I'm ready for it. So what we do is, we make excuses to ourselves, 
and we justify not doing what needs to be done. And thirdly, emotional escapes. We escape facing what is unpleasant because why? We don't want to, uh, you know, uh, disappoint ourselves. I was wrong. I can do better. Even in relationships, sometimes you find husband and wife don't talk to each other. There are many husbands and wives, they live under one roof, they live separate lives. They come to events, mashallah, smiling, they go home, they don't talk. Tell mom, I want food. Tell dad, it's in the microwave. And dad is there, mom is there. So why don't you just speak to each other? No, something happened five years ago, four years ago, and you keep it in you all the time. So what happens is this issue here. Emotional escapes. You don't want to face the reality. Look here, say sorry. Why should I say I'm sorry? She was wrong or he was wrong. Never mind, is it the main thing in your relationship right now? Is it good for your kids? Good for your house? Good for your health? No. Good for your community, if it's a community matter? No. So these are the three things. Action cop-outs, we block out focusing. We don't focus, don't think about it. We don't think about it. Some of our kids are on drugs. And not our kids, Muslims, mashallah, we don't do drugs. Yes, they do. It's haram in Islam, but people do it. It's real. Don't fool ourselves. Is there spousal abuse? Yes! Big time! Ask those who counsel. Those who know Islam, mashallah, Rasul. Never mind what the reality is otherwise. Address the issues. Number two is the one, mental excuse, self-deception. I'll do some other time. It's a very common one, by the way. And emotional escapes. You don't want to deal with it right now. Not now, not now. Some other time. And you always delay it, and hence, nothing gets done. Then there are types of people who procrastinate, types of people who don't do things. MashaAllah, the first one, perfectionists. If everything isn't perfect the way I want it, I don't do it. So what they do is, they work with nobody. They don't work with anybody. Yeah, that white blue. The white is blue, I want cream. The blue is the same, like that. it's not matching. Why is one lighter there? So everything is a problem. Now the problem isn't so much in the things, it's in your own self, your own mentality. So, perfectionist. If it's not perfect, I don't do it. And you know what? You'll never do anything because nothing but Allah is perfect. Absolutely nothing is perfect except Allah. So you'll never do anything new. Then the dreamer, great ideas. Oh, we should do this. And I think inshallah we'll have an Islamic... This. When? Where? How? Dreams are good. But dreams with your eyes open, dream with your eyes open, look at the reality. Great ideas, no action. There are many people who will tell you exactly what needs to be done. How do you put the community right, or the society right? This, this, this. What are you doing about it? Oh, I don't get involved. So how will it get right? Not me, uh, not you, not me, then who will do it? Number three, the warrior. That if we change things, you know, it will rock the boat. Let's keep it the way the Maharaj. So the boat goes in the wrong direction, it keeps on going in the wrong direction. If you're going on the wrong freeway, you end up in the wrong destination. You can't say, well, I'm going to buy myself a Porsche and continue in the freeway. It will be a nice ride, but you still get the wrong destination. When you get there, you'll be disappointed. That's why many of us at the end of life are happy. Because we didn't end up where we intended to go. And when we were halfway on the wrong track, we didn't think, think of turning back. You see? You'd rather be at the bottom of a ladder which you want to climb than to be at the top of a ladder which you don't want to be on. Get down, go on the ladder which you want, at least you're on the right path. Number four, the defier. Does not want to do what others are doing. Why? Well, I don't want to do it with them. No, no, I want to be different. No, why? No, no. Crisis maker, crisis maker, everything is a problem. MashaAllah, this is, uh, we get people uh, specialists in this. Everything is a problem. Anything you say is a problem. They are the four finders. Four finders. Anything. You see this note? For the mountain, why is it so sharp? No mountain is sharp like this. Everything they find a fault with. And you know what? Because nothing is perfect, you can't find a fault with everything. Yeah, there are faults. Nothing is perfect. There is a fault in everything. The mic wasn't working too well. The speaker was a bit boring. A little bit boring. Whatever. Everything. So. Nothing is perfect, it's Allah. So if you are a perfectionist or you are a crisis maker, then they are overdoer. There are some people who procrastinate not because they don't get involved, they get too involved. So they do everything and nobody can do everything. 
And that's why I have another philosophy. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you must do everything. And just because you can't do everything doesn't mean you mustn't do anything. Just because I can do something doesn't mean I must do everything. And just because I can't do everything, it doesn't mean I mustn't do anything. Do the best you can with what you have from where you are. Whatever little you can do, Allah will hold you accountable to the extent. I give a story, I don't know if I mentioned it last time, was it here or somewhere else. There's an incident in South Africa where a child was playing on the beach and some sometimes animals like whales or some fish, they beach themselves. You know, they, they come out of the water, sometimes a big wave pushes them out, or sometimes some of the animals, the lack of oxygen or food, some of the elder ones may come out and allow the younger ones to live. Allah wa'ala. Anyway, so this boy was on the beach and there were like thousands upon thousands of starfish. So this boy picked up a starfish through the water. Took another one in the water. So the uncle walked by. He said, son, what are you doing, son? He said, uncle, I'm trying to save the fish. The uncle said, you nuts, son. What difference will it make? So the boy picked up one more fish. He said, uncle, it will make a difference to this one. And he threw it back. He cannot save all the fish, but he could only save one. Like we, we cannot feed the whole poor in our community. But can you feed one person? Can you? When are you going to do it? Waiting for the mosque? Or for the organization, or the institution, or the church, the synagogue, the mosque. Well, they, oh, they never do anything. So when are you, when are you going to do it? Since they are not doing it, what are you doing about it? So excuses. So the idea is, be careful of being an overdoer. Some people do too much. You either get burnt out, or you do nothing well. Because you do too many things. And that's why you can't really do what needs to be done, because you're still busy doing the other thing. If I'm giving the speech, and getting the food, and checking the sound, what am I going to do? So, this is very important in organizations to be able to delegate, very important. But be careful not to be the overdoer. Take on too many tasks and not be able to do any of them uh, well. Then. <coughs> then you get the other one, the one who's a failure. The one, I mean, sorry, not, the consequence of procrastination, sorry. The consequence of procrastination, if you delay everything, you end up not doing what you're supposed to do. And in that way, you fail to achieve what could have been achieved. Second thing is regret. Many people, they live the length of their life, not the depth of their life. We live a long time, but then live life fully. Live life to the full. Life, live life to the full. Live with love, with compassion. Live life, enjoy life. Enjoy what you do, do good. Enjoy doing good. If, if, what, if you enjoy doing what is good and your secret, whatever is inner within you is good, and the wrong you do disappoints you or, or you feel bad about it, then you're a good believer. Enjoy what is good. Do good things and enjoy doing good. Align yourself with finding enjoyment in what is right, what is good. And then, of course, besides failing in doing what you're supposed to do, Besides regretting, regretting the fact that you didn't do what was supposed to be done, the idea of guilt, why did I not do that? Why did I not do that? I could do it, I could do that. At the same time, don't become despondent. One thing about Islam, don't encourage the idea of pessimism. To be pessimistic is part of bad character. Don't be pessimistic. Okay, I didn't do it, what can I do now? Don't say, oh, I didn't do it at that time, so now I'm hopeless. No, no, no. Now that I'm here, now that I'm aware, now that I'm conscious, what is it that I can do right now? I cannot maybe do as much as if I started 20 years ago or 10 years ago. But since I am here, since I am conscious, what is it that I can do right now? So this is the issue. Don't be negative, even if you have delayed, even if you have procrastinated. But now that you know where you are, you want to. One of the important things for us, generally in, our, in, in activating ourselves, is be willing to face the reality. Some people have only ideals, which are good in a way, but ideals only are not good enough. Ideals are good, always good. Identify your goals. What are your goals? What are the principles you live by? Some people, they have a great goal. We want to do that. If I have to rob or steal, I'll still do it. No. Your goals must be based on principles. Otherwise, your goals are not good enough. You see? So goals, principles, Everyone has strengths and everyone has weaknesses. 
And if you're working in institution or organization, there are people who have some skills and there are others who have better skills. And there are some who don't have that skill that some other people may have. Use the strength and in that way you are able to fortify yourself, able to strengthen and build up. So, identify your goals and your principles. Not just goals. I want to become rich. You don't have to rob the bank. No. Alright, so goals and principles. Strengths and weaknesses. Are your present actions in keeping with your values? What are your values? If somebody were to ask you, what is one word that will describe you? Honestly, what do you think it would be? Don't answer. Do you cower? Hypocrite? Loving? Compassionate? Honest? Caring? What do you think it would be? Think be? Just think about it for a moment. What do you think if someone were to ask just one word to describe Sa'adullah, what is it? I know talks too much is one of them. But besides talking too much, what is the one thing if people would describe in any one of us? What do you think would be the ideal description? Honestly, think about that. One word. Your name and that word. What would that word be? What would you like it to be? So, set are your present actions in keeping with your values? Then set realistic goals. Don't do the impossible. I want to make da'wah, I want to make everybody present or Muslim. No, you won't. Makkah didn't become Muslim all of them. Relax, it is. Do what you can do. Otherwise, if you set the standard too high, you set yourself the task of failure, the possibility of failure. Yes, you aim, you do, but be realistic. When you're unrealistic, you'll always fall short. So set realistic goals. What do I want to do? Why do I want to do it? That's for that. It'll give you your principles and values. How do I get it done? And then, when do I want to have it done? Take time. Something's going to happen immediate. Some midterm, some long term, some not even in your lifetime. Depending on what it is. In order to get that in order, prioritize and use your time wisely. Don't spend too much time doing one thing. If I'm running an exam, for example, I can't say, I'm going to focus on my English. My English is very important, right? Why? My maths is in what language? In English. My science is in English. My history is in English. So isn't English most important? Yes, it is. But if I only study English, I'll fail. I'll pass English with an A. I'll fail maths, science, geography, biology, everything else. So though it's very important, it's important as a vehicle for study and so on. You can still improve your English afterwards, but don't wait till you master it so much and exclude everything else. So the idea is prioritize. Though it's important, it's not the only thing. Salah is fun. You can't say, well, I'm going to pray the whole day, all day, all the time. So good. So nice. And modify your environment to remove obstacles. If you have bad friends, get rid of your bad friendship. If you have a bad relationship, try to change the situation if you can. If you have financial difficulty, see what you can do to, to alleviate them. What needs to be done? What can you do about it to the best of your ability? So modify your environment. Then take effective action. Life, the reality is, as I mentioned here, life is temporary. The certainty that life can't be too long and the possibility that life may be shorter than we, are, we assume it would be. This should make every person want to do what needs to be done as well as can be done as soon as it can be done. Do what needs to be done as well as you can do it as soon as you can do it. Do what needs to be done. It's very important. Prioritize. Ihsan, do it to the best of your ability, whatever it may be. And at the same time, do it. He said, do it, do it right, and do it right now. Do it, do it right, and do it right now. In other words, do, activate, aim for excellence, and time. The Rasulullah said, Kama tadinu to die. As you do, as you do, so shall you be rewarded. Don't expect to get something if you don't aim or work for it. I'll read this one here. Right. I want to give you all the notes. I want you to 
to, to read through them. I'll give it to you just now, by the way. And as I mentioned to you that tradition at the beginning is not a tradition of the prophet, it's a saying of the wise. So just rectify those an error in the print there. So, we need to approach the world and engage the future with an open mind. Open mind. Open mind implies you must use facts and reality to pursue the truth. And how do you do that? First of all, your perception. If your perception is wrong, everything else will be clouded. If I wear green glasses, I see everything is green. Not because the world is green, because, and wallahi, I do see green when I wear the glasses. Why? Because I'm wearing green glasses. And if I say I'm seeing green, wallahi, I'm not lying. I'm not lying. But the problem for me to realize, I'm wearing green glasses. It reminds me of a, of a joke. Some kids were, the uncle was sleeping, you see. So kids wanted to you know how kids are sometimes put something in the uncle's mouth or in his ear or something. So some kids took some cheese and they dropped it on the uncle's moustache. And it was this, uh, what, uh, what this gorgonzola cheese, what do you call it? The one that smells. Gorgonzola cheese, whatever you call it. But it doesn't smell always good, by the way. So the uncle woke up after one, it smells bad. So he said, the he went to the kitchen. He smelled bad there too. He said, was my wife cooking some? He went out. He went, the whole world was smelling bad. Was he lying? No. But the problem was, the world wasn't stinking. It was his moustache on his nose, under his nose. So many of us, we smell the stink. But many of us don't know is a cheese on our moustache. Ladies, you're lucky. You don't have boys. Anyway, so perception. If your perception is wrong, whatever you see will be clouded. There's a problem with many of our people. Our perception of religion, our perception of deed, our perception of... It's so restrictive, so constrictive, so unreal, so far-fetched, so removed from reality, that you cannot operate in society. So you withdraw. So you make small enclaves so you can live all this way. Removing darkness through light, knowledge. Removing evil with good, character. And replacing hatred with love, compassion. I mentioned earlier in my first speech about hikmah, about wisdom, about, 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 about rahmah and compassion, I mentioned these points. This thing was not easy to do. This ability to be able to uh, look at the self, analyze the self, analyze reality, and then realize that perchance what I'm doing and the way I'm doing is not maybe the best way, there may be a better way to do it. It takes a tremendous amount of, of courage and integrity. And when you talk about those kind of challenges where we are uh, faced with, those things we assume just to be okay, and there are greater, greater uh, uh, principles and values we are overlooking, it's very hard to incline or change ourselves, except if we have a tremendous amount of patient perseverance. So what do we need to do? What do we need to do? All of us, each and every one of us, all of us can make excuses. And some of them are better. But we need to move from making excuses to providing alternatives. Everyone can give an excuse. What's the alternative? What's the idea? From focusing on the faults to finding solutions. Faults we have enough. You know when I counsel husband and wife, I ask the husband, tell me brother, what is what do you think are your bad points? He'll put one or two points. I'm bad, I short temper. One two points. I ask the lady how much you have, she put one or two or three stuff. Then I ask, okay, here's a paper, tell me all the things that you think bad about him. One page, can I check, can I have another page please? Same thing. How come you see all the faults in another person but you can't see your own? That's what the Rasul said. Tuba liman shughluhu uyuba wa nuyubi nas. Glad tidings to that person whose ability, who has the ability to be able to see his or her own shortcomings. Glad tidings to that person who has the capacity to see their own shortcomings. So I can tell you all your faults. You can tell me all my faults. But you can't tell me your own faults and I can't tell you my own faults. Why? This, the glass are very green. And boy, do I look good when I look in the mirror. Oh my goodness. Green glass looks so good. That's how I see myself. That's how I want to see myself. So the reality. So, focusing on finding on faults to finding solutions. So, moving from blaming others to analyzing ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yes, other people have faults, they have wrongdoing there. That... Besides blaming other people, what about analyzing ourselves? Focus less on the inactivity of other people and look at my own possible contribution. 
Why aren't they doing that? Why aren't they doing that? Why aren't they? What is that I can do? From making promises to fulfilling commitments. Everybody promises. Oh, inshallah, mashallah, inshallah, subhanallah, tabarakallah. Wake up and do it. From letting things happen to making things happen. Don't be a victim of circumstance. Be the architect of your life. خُدِي كُلْكَرْ بُلَنْ اِتْنَا كَهَرْ تَقْدِيرْ سَ پَهْلِ خُدَا بَنْدَي سَ خُدْ پُوچھے بَدَا تَرِ غَدَا کیا Don't become an اِخْبَاس پیسے بات Don't become a victim of what's happening Become the architect If they prefer Allah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the ultimate architect Within the scope of your life You do to the best of your ability what you can do Then If you can do those things Then can you move from the shackles of the past What held you back To the possibility of doing something for the future Otherwise you'll just be stuck uh, with the same thing. All change we said begins with the self. And there are four dimensions to our individual self. You see, when you have an improved self, you can have a better individual. If you are physically and mentally and spiritually good, you'll be a better person. So better as improved self will lead to a better individual. A better individual can lead to a better society. If not, at least you're a better individual. And a better society can lead to the better, better world. So we need to look at these things. Tend to our personal infrastructure, which is the body, the mind, the heart, and the soul. Very, very important. Some of us look at the idea of ritual, as Rasulullah said, no person will be allowed to move on the day of Qiyamah, on the day of judgment, unless they answer four questions. No person will move unless they answer these four things. What are the four things about your life and how you spent it? Or in another hadith, about your youth and how you passed. So your life and what you did with your life. About your knowledge, how you benefited yourself and other people. About your money, from where you acquired it and what you did with it. And about your body, how you used it or abused it. This is a deal. You can't say, I eat how much I want, I can be flabby, doesn't matter. I... No, Allah wants you to be as far as possible, physically, mentally correct, outwardly pure, spiritually clean. Then you are, then you are able to do stuff. Al Mubil Qawi, Khair al Mubil al Da'i, the Rasul al Believer who's strong is better than a believer who's weak. It doesn't mean better in that you are high class, it means you're able to do more things. You are more capable, you have enabled yourself to do stuff. So safeguard the physical well-being. And I mentioned the hadith. Pay attention to the mind. You are never too old to learn. Think of your thoughts. What are those thoughts which are wrong? You can't say, well, I always thought so, my father thought so. Uh, I should think so too. Bless your father, maybe he was right. And then continue believing that. If he's wrong, it's wrong. What was the argument against the Rasul? Inna wajidna abana. We found our fathers believing this. So what did their fathers believe? They were wrong, they were wrong. Or maybe it worked for that time, it doesn't work right now. So pay attention to the mind. You, you're never too old to learn. You're never too old to learn. In Islam, you're from the study of al-Mahdi al From the cradle to the grave. It's no limitation. Talib al-Ali al-Farida ala kulli Muslim or Muslim. Obligated on Muslim, male and female. It's a weak tradition that says, seek knowledge even in China, which indicates, nonetheless, that it's a tradition that's come down to us through Islamic legacy, but it's an Islamic, at least, words of wisdom. But in other words, there's no age barrier, there's no gender barrier, there's no geographical boundary. Learn. So you know, you can't say, well, I got a degree, I'm a doctor, I'm a sheikh, or I'm not. No, you know. So always, and also, Part of the intelligence of people is learning to do what is right. They ask Luqman al-Hakim. Luqman al-Hakim is a person, a surah is them, a chapter, a chapter is Hadul Aqim in the Quran. And he, according to the majority, vast majority of ulama, was not a prophet. Vast, vast majority, but no, he wasn't a prophet. Some very few hold that he may have been a prophet. But anyway. So Allah takes his advice to his sons and he documents it in the Quran. Luqman al-Hakim, his advice to his sons, Allah took the advice from his and he quotes him in the Quran. That Luqman was asked, how did you become a wise man? So you go to some college, you get a PhD in philosophy. He says, no, I observe the foolishness of the foolish 
and the wrongfulness of the wrong, and I avoided that. You saw something is haram, something is bad? You don't have to get a degree for that. You don't, don't do that. Don't say, well, everybody does it, then you go. No. Observe the foolishness of the foolish, observe the wrongfulness of the wrong, and avoid that. So, pay attention to the mind. Keep getting smart. Huh? And why is it? By keeping yourself informed. You never know everything. You never know everything. How about anything? Nurture the heart. Very important. Some people can't show love. Some people can't show care. I remember one Friday, one uh, Eid, I gave a, 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 a khutbah and I said about Ibrahim alayhi salam. Some people focus on the knife and cutting it. That's fine, but the idea was look at the relationship. Yeah, but in the Arab, in the Abahab from the Malatra. Ya Buddha. Oh, my son, in the Arab from the Manami, and the Abahab. It's an old man, small boy. Allah reveals to him. And Ibrahim was the Ali Salam. Allah reveals to him Khalilullah, he's a friend of Allah. And one from Allah said, I tested him. When it denied Ibrahim Rabbu with Kalimatin for Atamahum. A perfect example. But Al Khalid and Allah Hanifa. He's a community by himself, a leader of the nations. Yet, the story for me, besides the sacrifice and all that, was the relationship between father and son. So he goes to his son, son, I see his way that I sacrifice you. What do you say? And the boy says, Yeah, but if I'm out, mom. Loving, compassionate. I said, You know what? Today, for Eid, in keeping with the memory and the Sunnah of Ibrahim, I want each of you, don't come and be the Sheikh and hug the Sheikh, not hug for me. Greet your family. Hug your daughter, your son. A girl came to me, she's crying. She Sheikh, the first time in my, my life, I remember my father hugging me. And then so much. Time. That's more important than the Sheikh. <coughs> Say, long line, what did you beat me? What? Okay. What about your family? She said, Sheikh, first time, my father, I can remember my father hugging me. And she said, I felt so good. Today is April. That means a lot. So, nurture your heart, show love. Say you love somebody. Somebody can tell us, Ya Rasulullah, I love that person. Prophet said, you tell the person, he said, no, so go tell him you love him. We, we are so, we so hard, we, we, we've almost become uh, dysfunctional in how emotionless we become, except when we are angry. Or oh, anger we can show. Anger we can show, mashallah. Humor, not so much. And love, uh, taboo. Rasulullah was in an Arab community. <laughs> were proud and arrogant people who were there and his son died and he cried. He said, Ya Rasulullah, you cry? We don't cry. He said, no, I cry. I lost my son and I'm sad about him crying. Someone said, oh Rasulullah, see the eclipse of the moon there. It's a sign from Allah. He said, no, that happens every year. But nothing to do with the birth. See, logical, rational, loving. They didn't kiss their children. It's your business. I'm going to kiss. Oh, it doesn't look too good. You Arabs don't, don't do it. No, you don't do it. So my point I'm making is, this is Sunnah of the Rasul. So love, hug your children, hug your spouse, say you love each other. Why not? I can't say, that's Sunnah of the Rasul. It's love. We don't see this. So our emotions in check. Keep our attitudes good and our thoughts pure. This will help to nurture our heart. And acknowledge our spiritual needs. We have spiritual needs. Spirituality is a reality. Okay? We are spiritual beings and physical beings. We are essence spirit. Okay? We have a physical house, which is the body. But we are spiritual beings. It's the physical body. So, acknowledge our spiritual being. Contemplate on the higher purpose of our lives, the deeper meaning of our lives. And when you say spirituality, internally, internally it refers to the purification of the self. Purification of the self, individually, from bad intention, from deceit, from hypocrisy, from cowardice, from prejudice. We are very prejudiced, by the way. Very prejudiced. We all say, mashallah, inshallah, what our brothers said. We are prejudiced. We are very prejudiced. And this is one of the first things the Prophet came to dismantle. Don't fool ourselves. Don't fool yourself. We are prejudiced. So, Purify the self. We say spirituality. You can make dhikr, read Quran and tasbih, and all this also because, But more than that, it's removing the bad intention, the deceit, the hypocrisy, the prejudice of ourselves. 
And outwardly, there's a spiritual dimension to ourselves too. It becomes manifested in our behavior, in our words. Spirituality is not what kind of garb you wear, which tariqa you belong to, or whatever it may be. It's how, you, how does it transform you? How does your love and compassion, your awareness of Allah, your love for the Prophet, how does it manifest itself in your relationship with the world? Do you reflect the prophetic personality in dealing with other people? Would you go to your neighbor who threw dirt upon you and go inquire, excuse me, are you feeling well? But the Prophet did. It's very important. So, nurture our, our heart and acknowledge our spiritual needs. Those are the four points I mentioned. Then, there are five important attitudes we have to check. Five important attitudes. These are very important. Because attitudes also affect life perspectives, how you deal. Your thoughts and your emotions affect your attitude. Your attitude influences your words and your behavior. And your behavior and your words reflect your character. And your character becomes your destiny. That's what you end up being. So thoughts and emotions are very powerful. Everything begins with them. I can make a joke, you all laugh, right? Because people, the people suffering in Gaza, in Kashmir, suddenly no one's laughing. Why? I said a thought in your mind. I said a word, and a thought came into your mind of, oh, people suffering. Now no one is laughing anymore, am I right? Why? You were laughing a few seconds ago. You smiled, you know, it's a good joke there. What happened right now? No. Because I put a word in your mind that brought a thought to your attention. Something else. Important thoughts. Thoughts and emotions. So, attitudes. First thing, your attitude towards yourself. But the most important one, but the fundamental one. Because your attitude towards yourself will determine your attitude towards the rest of the world. If I think nothing of myself, very bad. You see, this is love for others, but you love for yourself. And if I hate myself, then what? Then you're in trouble. Attitude towards the self. Because if your attitude towards the self will determine your attitude towards the rest of the world. You say, I don't care. So what if I die? I don't worry. I can't do that. But that attitude will trust to everything else. So what about God? I don't care about God. What? Why? The attitude towards yourself is the right. That's why Hassan al-Basri said, Man arafa nafsaw, faqad arafa rabba. Get to know yourself, get to know your Lord. Attitude towards oneself, and remember that your attitude towards yourself will affect all your other attitudes. If you have a low self-esteem, think nothing of yourself, you think nothing of your family, you may run other people down, belittle them too. Then attitude towards your faith, which is a very primary one. So the first one, it begins with it, but it's a primary one. Because that will reflect your attitude towards the creator of the world. Your attitude towards the creator. Okay? And my attitude towards the creator is what? Allah is my creator whom I'm accountable. If I'm accountable to him, I have better live a righteous life. So attitude is important. Attitude towards the creator. So then attitude towards the world. In other words, my attitude towards the creation of the creator. Towards myself. Towards the creator. Towards the creation of the creator. Then my attitude towards time. Because what you do with your time is what you do with your life. You waste your time, you waste your life. You can't waste your life without wasting your time. Time is life. So what do you do with time? Then, your attitude towards the future. What is your attitude towards the future? If you are hopeless, thinking negative, you, know, you, you, you foresee, you, you, you envision negativity, you won't be inspired to do something. If you say, oh, it's no use me doing that, it's not going to help, you'll end up in that. So your attitude towards the future, and the best attitude towards the future is one of having hope with Iman. Hope with Iman. Wallah, I'll do the best I can, but inshallah, things will be best. To improve our life, and we are, we are the people who give out the... the, the can, I get, can I get some of these boys here in front here? Yes. Yes. Come, come, here. Three of you. Come, 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 come. Activate, boys. Come here. And there's some, some girls to come here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. Give them some there. Just give out to the, to the side here. And here. Yeah. And get someone to help you. Yeah. Get someone to help you, guys, okay? All right. Six steps to greater living. Time is up, Shiraz. I'll finish in 5.30, don't worry. Okay. Six steps to greater living. People don't, just, don't, now, please, people, 
prioritize now. Don't look at the person giving the notes. It'll come to you, don't worry. And just relax, okay? So don't read the notes, just look at the top here for the moment. I'm almost done. Six steps to greater living. First one is moral consistency. You know your values? Don't say what Islam says, do what Islam tells you to do. Be honest, be truthful, be loving, be compassionate, be kind, be just. Okay? Moral consistency. Don't say what Islam says, do what Islam says. Don't just talk the talk, walk the walk. Number two, genuinely care. Genuinely care. If you genuinely care, you won't, be, you won't have self-interest. What is my position? What will happen to me? If I do that, oh, I lose out. You know, don't think about yourself. Think about what is the greater cause in yourself. Genuinely care whatever cause you're involved in. Have the courage to be unique. Unique. You are the only you that there is in the world. People can't cry with your tears, no smile with your face. No sing with your voice. They can try to sing like you, but it's with your voice. So be the best you that you can be. Be the best you you can be. You're not hopeless. You're not nothing. Allah has honored you by making you unique. What is my contribution? Now, however small you may think it is, do it. You know, the ocean is made up of drops, right? One drop is just a drop in the ocean, but if you remove all the drops, there's no ocean. You are part of the drop. Think about it. Then, foster meaningful relationships. Lasting relationships. Loving relationships. With your neighbor, with your family. Begin with the house. Begin with the house. Loving relationship, husband and wife, parent and child. Neighborhood, community. Foster meaningful relationship. And don't just expect people to have a relationship with you. Create the capacity for them to have a relationship with you. Prophet said, Al Mu'minu Ya'laf wa Yu'laf. Wala khayra fi man la ya'laf wa la yu'laf wa khayru nasi and fa'um in nas. A believer is one who is loving and lovable. There's no goodness in one who neither loves nor Allah Himself to be loved. And the best of people are those who are most beneficial to humanity. So, commitment, then foster meaningful relations. Then, commitment to excellence. Do the best you can. If other people don't do the best they can, that's up to them. You do the best you can. Don't be mediocre. Do something with wholeheartedly. Do it to the best of your ability. And then, do those kinds of things that will outlive you. Don't think about what is in it for me. Do things that, inshallah, that's why in Islam, that is what? That's the Qajariyah, for example. Prophet said, when a person dies, in qata'amal ula min khalaf. When you die, everything comes to an end. You can't, there's no prayer, no fasting, is done. But three things continue to benefit you. And what are they? A charity which you left behind, and people benefit from it. For example, I dig a well somewhere, and people drink from that water. Or I, give, I leave behind money, and people, or I build something, a mosque, a place, and people pray there. Or I teach some knowledge, and other people benefit from that learning. Or I leave a library behind and people read from the library. I may be dead hundred years ago. As long as people benefit from it, I get the reward. But I'm dead. There's no prayer, no fasting, but it continues. And what's the important lesson for us in this? That if you do things that outlive you, you benefit from it even after your death. Pray, I pray for myself. Fast, I fast for myself. When I leave something behind for other people, it benefit other people and even legacy. Even after my death, I still benefit. So, Jalaluddin Rumi, he said something very beautiful. He said, after our death, after our death, do not search for us in the tombs of the world. Don't go to the graveyard to look where, our, where we are buried. Search for us in the hearts of the people we have touched. Whose hearts do we touch? Do we touch hearts? Are we beloved even to our loved ones? Are we dear to our dear ones? Are we endearing to our dear ones? Are they dear to us? What causes do we fight for? What purpose do we live for? What do we hope to achieve in the short space of life? Think about this, inshallah. And then I, there are seven points after that about, uh, uh, about the wisdom of, of, to manifest the legacy. I gave you the seven points that come after that. And you can go through it when you want to. But I call the seven practical wisdoms. I will focus on that right now. But inshallah, you can read through, through that inshallah. I promise to finish on time. It's 5.31 people. I'm one minute over time. Sorry about that. So if you want, you can sue me, my lawyer Shiraz, and he'll take care of me. Shukran, salam alaikum.
Does anybody have any questions? That was a bad question. You had mentioned uh, the, using different methods of teaching, not like uh, what you were taught. What if the method, methods of teaching that you were taught were good methods? And um, uh, that is one side of the question. And then the other side of the question is, or are you referring to a technology? Uh, because you mentioned you have the internet, you have this now, and you understand what? I mentioned earlier on about teaching and training your children with a different training from the training that you have. You are very correct. I meant that. I meant in other words, in other words, the point I was going to make earlier on is before, if you were reading, writing, and arithmetic, you were three R's. And by the way, it's an old R, is reading, writing is. Writing is not the R, it's uh, W, and arithmetic is arithmetic with A. But the three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic. Nowadays, if you are not computer literate, you're not literate. If you're not computer literate, you're not considered literate because people use it more often. Means of communication have changed. So my point I'm making is, if you are going to insist, I, I was using this as an example, that I'm going to teach my kid just to improve his writing, which you should, by the way, and there's an important thing, and once he masses his writing, then he can have a computer or whatever, whatever. This is the most important, this is how I was brought up. This is, I mean, they, they do the assignment on the computer, they type it up right now. They speak in different ways, they use uh, text messages right now. They Twitter, they, they, different stuff they use. They do Skype, they, I mean, there's different ways of how they communicate. Even the communication has changed. The, the, the communication has changed in the last 25 years more than it changed in the whole of human history. All of human history, we have changed communication more than 25 years. The means of communication, the modes of communication. My point I was making, not on technology, I said just train them, in other words, realize that the, the mechanics and the tools they need will be different from your one. You can't, for example, say, I know the old story, you know, when I went to school, I only got 10 cents spending. Yeah, for 10 cents you could buy a Coke and pick up chips. Today for 10 cents you can't buy that, so the value is different. You know, in those days you could buy a house for ten thousand dollars. You can't buy the you can't buy a, a, a couple of bricks for that price right now. My point I make is be realistic. Don't use our measure. Don't use our measure as a measure for them. No, the values are the same. The principles are the same, but the tools need to change. Don't give them a writing pen only. You know, when I was going to high school, the calculator was, hey, oh my God, you press the button, oh, that liquid circle comes there, oh, press oh, 45 hours, oh man, one shot. That's old hat right now. I'm saying this example. So my point I'm making is, when you use, with, I was using technology as an example, but there are many other things. Even our mentality. Some of us, for example, came from societies where the only people we saw, if I lived in a village in Pakistan somewhere, and then, or in India or in Africa or something. The only people I saw were people of my culture, my race, my language, my color, everything mine. We ate the same food, the same people. That's two generations ago for some of us. Some people never saw people from another culture. Now, forget having neighbors who are Jewish and one is a Greek and one is a Hispanic. You yourself, up, your father, maybe you. For your kid, for example, if you married, I, I remember one day I performed the nikah ceremony, uh, kitab ceremony, and the person, the boy was getting married, his, the father was Palestinian, the mother was Puerto Rican. And his wife, his mother, the boy's mother, she was partly Algerian and partly Indian. So what is he? Forget not seeing the neighbor who's different from you, he himself was a multinational personality. One guy. He, what is he, Arab? Is he Algerian? Is he African? Is he Indian? What is he? So, two, two decades ago, his father came here, maybe never saw people from another village or another part of the world except his own. It's moved. Our society is different. Our community is different. The things that you did in your school, in those areas, in, it's vast different from the things that are right now. The challenges are different right now. Many of us are blind to this. We don't know what the youth are going through. They are going through a lot of stuff. For you to go to school right now, we can say, oh, I'm working there and nobody bullies me around. The kids are told, oh, you Osama bin Laden, you're a Muslim, are you guys terrorists? You didn't look through that when you were a kid. You never know. Now you get to work, you can tell people, hey, kid, what do you do? The kids mock you. You don't fit in. You wear hijab, they don't talk to you. It's not a joke. 
You can't say, oh, we wore hijab in Algeria all my life, or in Africa, or South Africa. Yes, she wore hijab, mashallah. But your challenge was different. Everyone wore hijab over there. So my point I'm making is, check the reality. Do what is right, but be aware of the difference. Some of us are not, or we didn't like that. I used to walk to school. We used to walk in Africa. We used to walk three miles to school. So, walk in the snow. Why? You got two cars, why must they walk? Why should they walk? No, that's how we did it. No, you are being selfish. Not because you're being, mashallah, training them right. No, no one walks to school. Why should, when you walk into school, everyone walks to school. No, people are walking to school. So when you try to implement those kind of things, because you want to be a good father like my father was, you are wrong. Your father did what he could. You should do what you can. This is the point I want to make.